national uh, uh, language. So if you, you, you use your favorite language when you curse. Uh, you use the specific lang language when you curse a government. You use the specific language for that <laughs> government. And everything else we do in English, and then it's fine. Yeah? And we curse so, the government, and somebody asks, which government? Like, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the world government. You know, if the, if, exactly. if the world was ever, ever prepared, you know, by a you know, common enemy, to face the challenge of getting united and build the totally different society, then mm. aren't we getting there or something? I don't know. Maybe this is one of the topics to discuss today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been told it is the time. Therefore, we should start. This is number three uh, in our series of leadership in times of crisis. Uh, and we just got used to it. So this is number three by number 50. We will get a routine by number 150. If luckily or unluckily the crisis lasts for three years, then we will be really good. So thanks to popular demand by the, um, let's uh, say, uh, non-Romanian non -Romanian speaking participants to this uh, um, uh, series of events, we have decided to switch to English and obviously then we will shut up and do nothing. No, um, joking. So this is um, a very good evening. And my uh, guests today, our guests today, uh, our hosts today are Adi Stanchu, my uh, um, fellow co-dean of uh, Master School of Management Romania. Um, Mircea Tsipla, our dear uh, lecturer with MS in Romania, and Vladimir Wane, also our dear lecturer with MS in Romania. We don't know, like in all the series that you've seen before, we don't know exactly what we are going to talk about. So, hence, may I ask you, what do you think we're going to talk about today? How to use... Uh zoom correctly <laughs> uh, how to how to be uh, a good leader over skype and uh, stuff like that we're seeing the end of that with the end of skype in a few months being absorbed in teams i guess <laughs> exactly <Yeah. laughs> so, even that even that is you know uh, temporary like us all so mircha what do you think we should be talking about today I think in moments like this, it's uh, equally important to look into the future and to look into the past uh, as well. And I think this exercise of constantly looking uh, both into the future and into the past uh, um, first uh, gives us a chance to understand better things that repeats and give us the chance to understand uh, better what's new and different this time. Uh, plus, uh, if we have the chance, I would uh, bring a bit the conversation to Romania's reality and um, share a bit of uh, how I've seen crisis in Romania so far into the entrepreneurial env environment. But let me challenge you there, isn't Romania always in a state of crisis, more or less? Aren't we more prepared than others to face it? Um, I guess so. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, preparation uh, might help us. But on the other hand, um, Romania is dependent, I would say, too much on what, on what happens abroad. So uh, what happens to us, I think, uh, uh, has to do with what happens, especially in the Western world. And uh, keeping an eye there might help us survive better. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I would like to to be as you know, optimistic. Um, I, I, the, what I don't see in the world is, is a different kind of model. I mean, like as much as we were probably frustrated by our own government, um, it's not like the other governments are doing so much better. And we have, I don't know, a Northern light to 
to guide us in in this uh, in this crisis. It seems to me that all the governments are pretty much the same in in, in the way they are responding. And uh, what worries me is not necessarily the government's response, which was to was was expected, all things considered. Uh, I mean, the fact that we have a we have a, a, a nationalized healthcare all through the world. Um, it, it was normal that we have a very authoritarian intervention. Uh, the, the issue for me, the, the main issue is that most of the population is, seems to welcome this, this, uh, this new reality. And uh, when, when I talk to, I don't know, uh, people around me, I'm in virtual right now, and I, whenever I'm, I'm talking about other people or, I don't know, have discussions uh, with, with, with normal individuals, they want more intervention, more authoritarianism, more, uh, more state. And I, I don't see how we put the genie back into the bottle because uh, right now we're pretty much at home arrest. And yeah, probably they'll let us go at some point. I don't think, I don't know, the economy and everything will, will, will go back to where it used to. Because um, there's there's this appetite for 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 control from the top, and look at what's happening with China. For me, I mean, like the fact that China is right now a hero in this whole thing, if for, for many many people, is 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 troubling for me. I mean, uh, we're welcoming the Chinese overlords, and from the people who created this whole thing through censorship, uh, they are becoming the benevolent dictators who are gonna give us a hand and send us masks and equipment and uh, it's this is kind of what what troubles me the most um, about the issue and uh, indeed uh, it's like all the international institutions uh, disappeared overnight because uh, that's the issue with uh, the politics the business is international and it's global and it's so for quite a few years uh, by now whereas the politics continue to remain local. And we've seen in every kind of crisis so far, and not only in crisis, uh, the governments, they are making decisions based on votes right. and based on how popular one or another uh, decision is. Plus, you can see a cultural bias into the way they've approached it. In the Protestant world and in the Northern Europe, uh, uh, where uh, the society is more individualistic, obviously, it's up to every individual to, or at least that was the beginning of it, uh, to, to face it. Whereas in, uh, in um, countries that are, uh, let's say, more uh, communitarian, so to speak, plus the ones that uh, still have uh, the communism into their bones, uh, everybody's looking at the government to tell you what to do. Uh, but uh, one thing is sure, nobody knows exactly what to do. And I think uh, this is general. I don't think that one country knows for sure what they need to do. Then trial and error is, uh, I would say, the rule of the day. Uh, and it's going to be like this for the next coming weeks, weeks or months. We may look even like countries that have a, a, a more a, a, a large, longer tradition of, of I don't know, freedom, if you will. Like I don't know, take the United States, which is I don't know, the American dream. Um, they kind of brought freedom to the Western world, and they have this amazing constitution and and stuff like that. And it's it's all federal government there too. I mean, like states, pretty much. Um, uh, they raise their hands and say, "Like, oh, we can't do anything. Uh, we want the federal government to come and come and come and help us." Um, so there's, I'm I'm so shocked that there's not much difference between I don't know Romania and and even the United States. I mean, we have the government. We don't have local government as the the Americans do, uh, but even the even the states in in the heart of capitalism they raise their hands and they want the, the federal government to bring everything no uh, the, there is a difference here vladimir uh, in addressing the humanitarian part of the crisis 
we are we've all started from the same point and i think we go we all go through the same learning curve yeah. when about the financial crisis that everybody is expecting there you can see the difference between the more experienced and the less experienced one uh, for instance the united states they've reacted the second day in the previous crisis 12 years ago they've reacted the second month and the same with some of the european uh, uh, countries so dealing with economic crisis it's something that the most developed economies knows how to tackle. Dealing with uh, the virus, uh, that I would say is uh, different and uh, I don't see uh, ones being more experienced than the others. And I don't see ones seeing it coming more than the others. Because if you look now, retroactively, all the crises are so in the front of you, so to speak. The first information about the virus came on 17 of November, where suddenly people were dying of uh, pneumonia on the streets, and that was the first international news. So from 17 of, of, uh, of uh, November, every week, if you look behind, there were patterns that something happens. Though if you look at the evolution of Dow Jones, for instance, it continues to, grew, to grow aggressively, Till uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and even though looking now behind that, even the, the most experienced economists looking at it over at what happened of the, over the last three, four months, it was so obvious that we are going to get where we are now. But for some reasons, again, the, the warning system failed to, to tell us uh, the, let's say, uh, what's going on. And uh, now, I would say, coming to, let's say, to the business, we still have the chance to, to build the boat while it's not rain, raining yet. Uh, and Noah did the same. He built his, uh, his arch when he was not raining, not during the rain. Yeah, and sure. I, but, uh, this is a I, would, I would probably diff. build a boat if God gives me a call. Irrespective of the weather. <laughs> but we, still, yeah. we still can okay. split now, irrespective of the fact that, you know, the virus is the same for everyone. We still split the business that are under heavy rain already and the business that are seeing the clouds and the rain coming, but it's not raining yet. And I would say that the urgency now is for the ones that are not under the rain to start building that boat. What companies, have... Mitchell, what companies are not affected right now, are not under the rain? Because based on what I'm seeing, it's not that there are companies who haven't noticed the rain. I mean, most companies are underwater and drowning. Uh, uh, well, from, so where do you see lifeboats? From the clients I have so far, and we are talking daily with like dozens of clients in across all industries with right. our executive search business. I have clients that declared that they are having, or I'm talking about March, they had the best month in the history of the company. And some of the companies are 100 plus years old. Okay. Like for instance, the, 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 the household care companies and the consumer goods companies. And there are some other companies at the, the other end of the spectrum that had in March the worst month of their history. Um, the crisis is here, but it's far from being equally distributed. Um, and some of them, and then the response is, let's say, a product of three things. One is how quickly you get to understand what happens. Second is, and this gets multiplied with how quickly you can, you can, one, pivot in other businesses if your core business gets dry or implement measures to survive. And third, I would say is, uh, or the third factor here in multiplication is what are your execution capabilities? 
right. because I acknowledge is there is no time now to 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 let's say to generate big big strategic items. All the measures now needs to be I would say rather tactical than strategic. But still, <clears throat> the product of these three items, how quick you can understand the situation, how quick you can pivot mm -hmm. or uh, identify mm -hmm. actions and how quick you can implement them are the product of these three dimensions are, uh, uh, let's say, is embedding your chances for survival. And, uh, but I would argue a little bit here because, you know, when, when we talk about strategy, we advise companies to look at their strategic landscape as soon as there is a shift in the current market situation. So they have to reanalyze it. And I would argue is the best time to look strategically at your company right now. And whoever has not you know, been locked already for half a day or a day in a strategic board, rethinking where the threats and where the opportunities are coming from, like just thinking, not firefighting. Uh, um, if you have the I, time. You should do it. <laughs> Sergio, because uh, again, now I think the first assessment has to do with how far are the clouds for you. If you are mm -hmm. under the clouds, then I would say, well, maybe you can, you still have the chance to pivot and to take strong strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. If the clouds are somewhere at the horizon, but you see them coming in a month or so, or in, uh, uh, then obviously uh, you have the time to really go through several scenario pl planning and iterations so that you can pivot. Um, but it really depends on the capabilities. I, I'm going to tell you a story now that it's quite old. Uh, and uh, you all know about Prometheus, the guy that brought humankind, the fire, plus some other tools that he, he uh, has stolen mm -hmm. from uh, Athena's uh, uh, workshop. But Prometheus in Greek means the one that is capable to look into the future. And Zeus picked Prometheus to build the, the, the world because they were, uh, they were quite bored in the Olympus after all the fights and they need some, some kind of entertainment. And, Prometheus, and Zeus asked Prometheus to build the world. Well, Prometheus went home and home he has his brother. And his brother played a strong role into this, but his name was Epimetheus. Epimetheus in Greek means the one that can see only into the past. In executive search, a, a business we are running for, uh, for the last quite a few years, since the last crisis, the shift in how you evaluate and the kind of people you want to, 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 to hire changed dramatically. And in the VUCA world, nobody looked at the leadership qualities because something that was like the norm so far that was past success is the best predictor for future success was not the case anymore into the VUCA world. And then everybody started to look at something else instead of leadership qualities, at potential. But when, the, when you say potential, you mean exactly this Promethean kind of skills, which are intellectual curiosity, uh, learning agility, and insights which means the capacity to look into the future, which Prometheus, the smart guy of the family had, whereas Epimetheus, the idiot of the family, did not have. And this is something that we desperately need now before jumping into all the kind of pivoting and reinventing. This kind of mi mindset that makes us understand what is coming to us that helps us and even picking from our organizations the Prometheus to deal with. They might not be in the top positions. I'm seeing now talking to dozens of people, I see from CEOs that are already into the, into the pit stop mood, like in the Formula One, where the car stops for, I don't know, one second now. So everybody now wants to stop 
to stop for as small time as possible and then go ahead full speed into some others that are completely blocked where you are the CEO of the company and instead of acting, you, you just, you are like frozen. And then you need to understand this because you need this free, and I will finish with this. You need this free kind of resilience dimensions combined. The operational resilience, keeping the boat, uh, uh, keeping the, the company running, the strategic resilience, your ability to really understand the new the new reality and to pivot, but it all starts and at, at the fund, at the foundation of it is the individual re, uh, resilience. You really need to assess inside your leadership team where they are in terms of of individual resilience and how able they are to run fast, because sometimes the solution may come from different from other levels of the organization than from the top seat. Mm. I, I like the turn of discussion and I want to challenge Adrian, 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 with your first comment, which was two seconds instead of one second, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what, what, what you meant. But I think there is a deeper level to this. <laughs> with a, now, if you take a two second stop instead of a one second stop, what other dimensions do you see to the leadership moving forward huh? in this time of, uh, you have to unmute yourself. I, I don't think I can unmute you. You have to unmute, unmute. I like was this. saying pit stops in Formula One are two seconds, not one second. Yeah, no, no I, I got that. <laughs> okay. But I wanted to hear also your opinion on this more, and I'm really happy that in, in uh, this session, we're looking at the more philosophical dimension of the leadership. And we're looking at the types of, uh, uh, Prometheus for me is the finance guy, uh, Epimetheus is the accounting guy, you know, so I think it's, uh, so what, what do we need to seek in terms of leadership traits inside us? and inside our organizations? There are several questions into one here. Let, let me try to, all. I, yeah, let me take a slighter broader view. Um, first of all, leadership is about dealing with change. At least the way we define it and look at it, uh, it's about dealing with change. Uh, it's not about operating a predictable system. You don't need leaders for that. You need leaders to navigate uncharted waters. And these are by definition, the mother and the father and the, the aunt and the grandmother of uncharted waters. So what happened is that over the space of less than one month, the requirement for quality leadership all over the world has skyrocketed by several orders of magnitude. And this is where we are completely unprepared. My experience is uh, that this world, at least in the professional world, but I would venture to say the political world as well, is massively underled. At least in the professional world, the paradigm is that there is over management and under leadership in most organizations and in most positions. Now, having said that, this parable of Prometheus um, speaks about the ability to see the future. In times of change, your ability to see the future shrinks dramatically. And this is what makes it so difficult. If we could see the future, the answers would be easy. But the problem is that we don't. And when we don't see the future, the, the mind tends to react in a way that it tries to hang on to something that it knows. We decode uncertainty as basically as anxiety, not as fear, but as anxiety. There is a difference. There is a major fundamental difference between anxiety, anxiety and fear. Fear discharges adrenaline and moves the body in a fight or flight response. Anxiety paralyzes. Anxiety doesn't have an object, fear does. 
sphere has a clear object and therefore it it channels energy in a, into a certain direction anxiety doesn't and because and uncertainty produces anxiety and it produces a kind of threat response but it produces, produces more freezing than than action so we need to find a, a level of certainty in the midst of uncertainty and i think the question that people should ask right now is what is that level of certainty what can we be sure about that we can build our response around it and to be very open to change and agility about everything else i don't think you can plan a course right now but i can i think you can plan a response that takes in the reality as it comes and is able to navigate fast and be prepared to fail fast uh, uh, the reality i think it's very dangerous to to freeze right now and for, for very many reasons i think that people who are waiting now for things to stabilize and then plan a course are going to find themselves out strategized and out planned from the new reality and they will find very difficult to build their operations back they will find difficult to bring their people back to bring the energy back to find the new meaning uh, in the work uh, i think the the simple fact that we have energy and we have movement is already an achievement I'm not saying that we should move blindly like we don't uh, have that much movement if I may 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 say which is kind of encouraging the freezing uh, at this moment the simple yeah. fact that we yeah. are kind of recluded yeah. and individual and we are stuck at home it yeah, yeah. puts you in a state of yeah. mind that is more about you know freezing yeah. than it is about action although Sergio based on our discussion with our our students and alumni uh, many people are actually busier uh, these days I'm not one of them but many are um so i guess uh, to to finish what like running in circles yeah to finish like my... overdoing tactics and not doing strategy to finish my intervention i think there are levels on which there is stability always uh, systems behave at at different levels and we are used to have to having predictability at a very operational level and Uh, this was a reality that was in changing already uh, even before this crisis but this crisis has destroyed operational predictability it's impossible to plan for the next week or for the next month we've been through this in 2009 and i i think we kind of learned a little bit uh, of a lesson at, at that point and we can use it today there is no predictability in the near future so the the question is where do we find predictability what predictability do we have and there is some predictability left we just need to look for it maybe our core competencies are still the same maybe the the behavior of of people and of consumers is still the same maybe the values that we built based on our organization on are still the same there are something that will be the same and we need to reorganize our world around those things the biggest challenge will come for organizations who are who build themselves on the a paradigm of predictability this classical paradigm of management of uh, predict organize plan staff uh, control you know all, all of that this paradigm was half dead Uh, already before this crisis but right now it's a it's a complete waste of uh, energy so if, if the people were used to run their operations in this way this is something that is going to to be very very difficult make life very very difficult for them right now let, let me let me add something to 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 this and then coming back to a previous argument that vladimir made uh, adrian and uh, um and, and this is about you know uh, people relying more on the governments and aren't governments the very typical organizations that fully rely upon predictability and fully rely upon you know being sure that they deliver on on stuff and, and so on what are we do what the things that we are doing now 
which is actually creating a more author or not only creating, but endorsing a more authoritarian leadership in our society. Is this something that helps or is this something that hinders us? What do you think? I am, and I'd, I'd like the other panelists to answer as well. I, for one, I'm a libertarian as a philosophy, so I don't believe that government can fulfill the roles that people are kind of uh, asking for it from it, even before this crisis. And I think that this, is, this has, a, for me, a systemical explanation. If you try to build a system where you expect something from, let's say, an educational, an, an inspector from the Ministry of Education, and you expect some service from that person. That person are answers to a director of something in the Ministry of Education, who answers to a state secretary, who answers to a ministry, who answers to a prime minister, who is appointed by a party, who goes to election every four years. And I'm the shareholder. Imagine doing this governance in a company, the shareholders, are called to vote every four years and they vote for a board who uh, then hire somebody and they hire somebody and they hire somebody. And basically nobody knows what their job is and what they are expected to do. And this is a system that cannot work. It, ju it just cannot work. So in my view, we are asking too much from the state anyway. Now, having said that, having said that, we do have big states now. Remember that states, when they were invented, they were in the, in the percentage, single digit percentage of GDP of size, below 10%. Now in all the, all the developed world, they are in the 40-ish, 40 40 some places in the 60-ish percent of, of GDP. So they have become bloated anyway. If they are so bloated and they cannot fulfill this function in times of crisis of um, leading the, the society in times of countries, they, then they are really useless. So I think uh, it's a good time for states now to show why they exist. At the same time, I'm very, very concerned by the kind of power that we put in their hands because in its history, the state has never decreased, never, ever. The only times where the state decreased was after revolutions, after revolutions or major crises like wars. But otherwise, the state always increased and it, it never pulls back. It's like the Soviet Union. They come and rescue you and then they forget to take the army home. Uh, plus, there are so many generals in all the governments that never fought a war. Uh, and they might miss the opportunity uh, forever, uh, I think. But it, it, it's interesting. I was, look, the, the whole 20th century management paradigm came from, uh, from the, the Second World War. Uh, and it's a war that uh, it was attributed first to General Patton, then to Jack Welsh, who says, uh, which says, if you take them by their balls, their minds and hearts will follow. And that was the standard of leading an organization in the second half, at least, of the 20th century. The issue, I would bring the discussion in Romania. There are so many leaders that are, that are so last century leaders in Romania that continues to lead with the general pattern, say, it was not his say, but it will remain like this forever. If you take them by their balls, their minds and hearts will follow. Whereas this century, and I've asked, I've asked Professor Hogan for this, and I've asked him, what should be the sentence, this sentence translated into this century? And he, he posed a bit and then he said, probably if you take them by their heart, their minds and balls will follow. And I think this is key, uh, but it's so tempting yeah, instead of forever. I mean. <laughs> it's so tempting instead of aiming for the heart to aim 
a bit lower, that all these generals that never have had a chance to fight a war, both in the business world and in the uh, and in the uh, real world uh, war, uh, uh, they were jumping to doing it. I'll give you an example. I had a conversation today with two of my clients. One I will name, the other not. I talked to Schneider Electric and to one of their competitors. Schneider Electric today already set up a ventilators plant in a joint venture with Early Kid and with another producer. And they already have their own mask uh, 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 factory. Whereas their competitor didn't even thought of doing it, even though they had similar supply chains and they have similar capabilities into executing it. What is the difference between an organization and in two months time, two, two weeks or three weeks time already pivoted and are already into production with something that they never produced before? And the other that it's still stuck into the old business model. Uh, I think it's exactly this. Uh, the fact that uh, one, the way I am assessing them, the fact that one let the power into the other levels of the organization, and it's a 21st century organization, and the other who's still a 20th century organization when the 80 plus years old guys in the board needs to first understand then approve something. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how do you see winning hearts in, in, in this crisis, in this situation? Uh, because it feels to me that uh, the entrepreneurs and the businessmen are, are the bad guys who are kind of firing people and they're trying to I don't know, save whatever that is to be saved. Um, and uh, their stuff, and save their stuff. Exactly, save their stuff. They're, they're real. Their, yeah, uh, save uh, their money and stash their, their riches while, uh, while, yeah, the government steps in and takes care of uh, the poor and the starving and, and stuff like that. Um, clearly, there are companies who are doing uh, I don't know better than better than others, but uh, I mean there are. In two weeks in Romania, we had uh, a million people who filed for unemployment, and uh, it's uh, it's ten times worse in the United States and probably in Europe. Uh, God knows how many. So um, yeah, clearly it's 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 the and we already seeing it's the fault of the capitalist uh, capitalist system, um, the the neoliberal. Uh, whatever uh, uh, cabal uh, shows his true its true face, and uh, it's it's the government who has to come in and save us from from the evil bastards. So how do you how do you even have a conversation when when this is the the, the theme of the discussion right now? Because right now, I mean, like all companies right now, the the same companies are firing people. Uh, uh, salaries are going down. Even in, in, we're talking about the companies who are trying to survive and to continue to provide services, and they are still doing those things, and they have to, I, I, I think. Uh, and then there are companies who are gonna go bust uh, no matter what. Um, so compare that to I don't know what the government is doing, and we're the bad guys in the eyes of many, many people. And I've seen that uh, by by talking to people. Ah, oh, that guy got fired. Or, or whatever and yeah because the company does not exist anymore yeah but the 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 owner was rich so yeah he gets to keep his house i guess um during the last crisis i was uh, cfo in coca-cola and uh, when the crisis uh, started we had uh, i think he was already the ceo of the company dimitris lois he's dead now uh and he asked all of us, the management team, to start doing road shows and talk to people at every level into the organization. And then uh, my general manager at that time, uh, he was not much into this. And he 
he was that kind of guy that would never, you know, face somebody until he has all the answers. And then he somehow delegated uh, uh, this uh, task mainly to me and to the other uh, guys into the, the management team. And we started to do these roadshows, talking to people in the warehouse in Vatradorne, in the production plant in Timisoara, and so on and so forth. But the simple fact of going there without again having all the answers and talking to them and really understanding and communicating face to face, or I would say heart to heart, matter, mattered a lot to me. And, and I've learned this lesson that uh, if you really communicate heart to heart with people at all levels in, in the organization, you can start with this and you can win the heart. And then the other two will follow. Another example is the one that we are facing now. One of the businesses we have into the family is a restaurant business in Cluj. We have three restaurants there, all together around 70 people. And we shut down the restaurants. A few days ago, the government uh, uh, shut down the whole, the whole business. But there are like 200, 300 people in hospitality now, they are, they are, and they are home. Nobody can guarantee that after the end of this, uh, 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 of this period, they will come back. Some of them, they are already taking new jobs, like drivers for the, for the uh, parcel companies and so on and so forth. And keeping, and I have my cousin there who's running the business, and he keeps daily the communication with 70 people because he wants to know what issue they have, what issues they have, uh, how he can help, and eventually, yes, we are interested if we can count on them at the end of the period. But even though they are home, even though they are in the, in the technical unemployment, so to speak, so we stop, let's say, a working relationship with them in a, in a way, being close to them daily and helping when we can with simple, you know, heart to heart uh, uh, interventions, uh, help gives us the comfort that once the period, uh, uh, you know, uh, what the isolation stops, we'll be able to hit the ground running. And if I may, I will add another example from the last crisis when I was for a period of time working in a restructuring, in turnaround management. What struck me at that time was talking to entrepreneurs, some of them very successful, they were every second week in, in the Ziarul uh, 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 Financiar uh, uh, with their picture, was that they were not able to answer to me a simple question. If everything go bust, how much do you lose? They were simply not aware of what is the dimension of, of loss they will take. Some of them, they, they did, not, did not remember that they've endorsed checks with their own uh, uh, um, uh, house and their own, you know, uh, uh, individual wealth. Mm -hmm. Some others, they were not aware of contracts and clauses there. And I think not only in crisis, every day an entrepreneur needs to go to sleep with this question. If something goes bust, how much do I lose without losing myself? And the second part of the question is equally important. Because losing yourself means, you know, when you, when you take piloting lessons, you learn what simple rule. I know this from, from an interview with, uh, with King Michael. Is that when, when your plane goes into clouds, all your sensors are telling you that the plane is, is shifting direction. But if you look at the, at the board, you see that the plane is keeping its tra trajectory. It's the same with honor. What all your basic instincts are telling you to go left, to save yourself at the expense of all the others, the honor is telling you to keep the, 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 the straight line, so to speak. And especially in moments like this, there is a huge conflict between our instincts that are merely, uh, that are only about survival and the honor 
that says, I'll be the same guy after this crisis. Then it comes to individual assessment. How much you can afford to be honorable. And if you have enough cash, at least for half a year or so, I think first you need to protect your reputation in the market and your customers and then your cost structure. But if you are bust and you have no money, at least have the honor to acknowledge. And as one of my former colleagues says, you better be red face once than yellow face all the time. I didn't feel the need to say anything. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you know, when, when there's a, there is an awkward moment of silence, um, someone needs to step in. So I was wondering, you know, we're talking about companies being bankrupt. We're talking about saving what can be saved. We're also talking about being honorable. And we are like, we, I see a lot of this, of this uh, nowadays. And there's a lot of, if you want, dilemma and making sure that you isolate the, the others from your problems to the extent that you can. So uh, there are moral dilemmas now uh, that, you know, the, actually are, are back to, to empathy and uh, putting yourself into the other's shoes. So it's kind of, you know, like the, the one um, uh, case that I ran across is that is okay to delay payment to your landlord for the rent as long as the landlord can finance that uh, with the bank, as long as the bank can finance that with the central bank and so on, is not okay not to pay the service, which is done by small entrepreneur companies, and you, they, you need to pay them for them to pay their people and so on. So this is, this, this is the kind of, uh, uh, of a situation that we are, that we are talking now while maybe a month ago, it wasn't okay not to pay on time at all. And um, we, are, we are now seeing this new definition of what honorable means in the, uh, in the market. And depending, of course, on your, on your own financials. Um, we, we look a lot at the previous crisis as a source of inspiration, but the previous crisis was fundamentally different in two things. Uh, one, it was very slow, like very slow compared to what we're seeing now. It took years to get to a fraction of the unemployment that we see after two weeks now. It took years and it, we, we never got the, that, that much. So this is one thing. The other thing is it was nobody trusted the system. We, the, 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 the sheer impact of the, of, of the previous uh, crisis was coming from the fact that nobody trusted the governments and the banks and the system as defined as such to be able to properly address the crisis. And uh, I would also say that there wasn't much hope in how easy it would be to reform it. Now, the optimist in me, which surfaces from time to time, would say that this time we have a much sudden, much more sudden crisis. We have a lot more trust in the system, whatever the system is. And we kind of see that if the outside um, crisis generator, the virus, suddenly disappears, we kind of go back to normal, although no one has ever seen that before. So is there anything flawed here? Are we lying to ourselves? Are we overly optimistic? Uh, I think so. Um, I, I, I really think that for most people, uh, uh, and I was guilty of this uh, until like a week ago, um, I think we, it, it's easy for us to enter into a, to a, into a state of denial, uh, or, or non-acceptance, let's say, uh, we, 
it's it's easy to tell ourselves that this is this is just a temporary thing and if we just sit quiet and uh, watch Netflix all day, uh, after a month or so, things will return to, to normal. Uh, um, and um, yeah, I think I think change can 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 only happen once we once we accept the situation. Uh, and there are probably layers of of acceptance. So. Um, yeah, and and I think this this non acceptance that is causing a lot of indecision and anxiety and deer in the headlights uh, scenarios, uh, it's because it was so sudden. I mean, like for God's sake, two weeks ago I had meetings and I was discussing about uh, I don't know a, a road show that I would have in, in the United States and all the conferences that I would attend and. Uh, the crisis didn't seem so so serious, and now I have to rethink everything. Um, so, and, and 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 accepting that that the world today is not the same as the world yesterday, I think it's I think it's hard. Clearly, it's it's unintuitive uh, for most leaders, and for sure for people who have never had a leadership position, or who are not even interested in ever having that responsibility. So uh, all starts with, with acceptance. And yeah, that comes to a lot of virtues that I don't know how many of us uh, have. And uh, I will add here, Sergio, because hope is a very strong ingredient of resilience. And I will refer to something that Adi said. Uh, the enemy of, let's say, of resilience are indeed fear and anxiety. What fear, uh, and they all have something to do in the equation with the rela relationship with the horizon. The horizon is for, a, for, for somebody with, with a healthy eye, it's uh, how much, 30, 30 kilometers or something like this, right? So this is the line of the horizon, more or less. If it's heavily it's raining, yeah. No, no, in, in clear sight. What fear does to you is, is bringing the line of the horizon very close to you, at less than a meter. And in fear, you are not able to see further this very meter around you. So suddenly all the horizon, 30 kilometers away, comes to one meter. Anxiety means you can still see the horizon, but you are unable to move. And I think you need to do this kind of self-assessment. Uh, and hope has to do with both dimensions. In anxiety, it's like a, it, there is a say that everybody in Silicon Valley knows, and I, I bet you know you know uh, you know it as well, which means do not confuse a clear vision with a short distance. The fact that you know where you want to be is not the same with the distance. A very good eye can see very accurately at 30 uh, kilometers. But it doesn't mean that his feet are able to run the 30 kilometers. Sometimes you have better eyes that, that, uh, eyes that fits. Sometimes you have better fits than I. You can run, but you, you don't know where to run. And uh, uh, yeah, that was my, my point that hope is a strong ingredient of uh, resilience. And in building resilience, you need to first self-assess if it's a problem of not being capable to move, anxiety, or if it's a, process, a problem of not being able to see, which is fear. Because at the end of the day, it's like in Silicon Valley. Do not confuse the clear vision with the short distance. We have a question from, from one of the participants, uh, or actually a challenge more, more than a question, which is, uh, and, and he's saying that uh, in times of crisis, we start a bit mistrusting each other at individual level. And this may affect it all. What, what do you say? What do you think? Is this the case? In your experience? 
I think it's the byproduct of the of the anxiety. Said you, um, anxiety makes you feel uncertain about everything, and it lowers your threshold of, uh, uh, if you want, um, tolerance to risk, uh -huh. and that makes we we all look at the others as strangers and potentially menacing. This is part of our tribal psychology. We constantly fight against it. We fight against it for like forever. This is how we build societies. But in times of uh, danger, anxiety shrinks this horizon as well. We have pushed our moral, our moral circle from our immediate uh, family and people around us to larger groups, to the tribe, and then we moved it to societies, and then we moved it virtually to the whole planet to some extent. But this moral circle is also affected by anxiety. It becomes smaller. So we, we stick to the people that we know and trust for a long time, and we start to become fearful of the others. It's an unfortunate byproduct. So will we go back to the nation states, to the tribes, to the families? I think we have gone back to the nation states. Look at the European Union. Look at the solidarity response of the European Union. Look at Romanians. I'll give you a good example. Romanians are maybe, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't necessarily qualify this way, but we are very hypocritical as a nation. So you see comments, Germany has not sent medical equipment to Romania. They, they kept the medical equipment to use in Germany, something that was destined for Romania. And then you see that Romania kept medical equipment in Romania that, and didn't send it, I don't, God knows where, and everybody cheers about that. So it's very okay that we, we look after our own interest but it's not okay if other people look after their own interest. So what you see actually is that there is a sort of pressure that is put on the political decision makers to put the interest of the tribe first. And this has started with Trump, if you want, as a, as a national policy, but this crisis has moved it pretty much every, everywhere else. And uh, we see that Europe is incapable of uh, pulling itself together and put together a sort of common policy that will show solidarity between nations. And this is to some extent also the same kind of phenomenon. And you'll see these tribes becoming even smaller than the nation states. In you the see it in the, in, the, you know, in the exhaustion of uh, toilet paper in the supermarkets where the smaller tribe kind of wins. And isn't it, you know, isn't this a, a, a different dimension of the tragedy of the commons in times of scarcity, uh, on the uh, times of fear of scarcity? I, if, we, if you remember the, the exercise that we do in the discovery camp with the, with the students about, about the tragedy of the commons and uh, the main finding, if you want, or the main conclusion there is the, the, the main ingredient is not the only one, but the main ingredient that you need to avoid it is trust between members. And what happens in, in times like this is that uh, trust is a victim of anxiety. And I think we're also reaping the, 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 the benefits of the, 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 the previous period, right? Uh, I mean, the, I, I don't think that the Romanian businessmen were that trusting of each other before. And now I, I think we're just get that level of mistrust amplified. Um, like going to, to practical, to practical uh, elements. Um, I've, I've heard uh, stories of companies who had very honest discussions with their vendors and with their suppliers where they got these like common understanding, like we're going to tough times. I will not be able to pay you the invoices as, as previously, uh, but 
I need you to do this for me so we can survive this whole thing together, right? I mean, we're, we're all in this, in this together. Uh, but those, that, those are anecdotes. I haven't seen them in, 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 in our country that often. I mean, I know for once that I tried to have that discussion with uh, some of my vendors and suppliers. Uh, and it was like, no, I, I need that invoice paid yesterday and blah, 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 blah. And I talked to other people and this level of mistrust and everyone kind of hating on everyone is, uh, is, is, uh, is something that uh, I think uh, happens because it wasn't, the environment wasn't very trusting <laughs> prior to the crisis. How do you guys see it? Um, I, I'll tell you something I've experienced, the life crisis. And I think uh, um, this is the hope for Romania this time. Uh, I don't trust that our government will be, I mean, we are left alone and I'm 100% sure that we are left alone into this. They already spent all the budget they had for this year and I don't see how and from where they'll produce more money. So relying on government to save the business in Romania, it's a pure utopia. It will never happen. But the hope in this statement is that we don't need the government to do so. And the hope is that looking how the Western world reacted is that they will be our salvation, which was not the case the last crisis. The last crisis, I, I left multinational environment to work for private equity in 2009. So in the middle of it. And what I've experienced in private equity is the fact that reliable, profitable, and with a going concern businesses, they were left without cash in Romania because the banks needed that money home. And that was and continues to be a huge weakness for Romania, the fact that only around 25% of the, of the, of the uh, financial system in Romania is Romanian versus Poland, where this is above 90%. And if something happens with these financial institutions home, at their homes, then we are in deep trouble. Because as one of the bankers said, don't take it personal, we just need to save ourselves before we save you. And Put your own mask I would, first. I will urge all the I will urge all the entrepreneurs in Romania to have this in mind first, to make sure that they keep an open conversation with the banks, and second, to really read between the lines. And I will give you some examples. If, for instance, suddenly at the meeting with your banker in the room, you see people either from risk or from restructuring department, then this is a strong alarm system. They will tell you they are here only to know each other and stuff. But this is exactly like if your, if your, uh, uh, if your family doctor will say, let's meet an oncologist. It's nothing, it's, it's no need to worry, but let's, Let's just meet an oncologist to, to have a chat with him. So this is, the, this is one of the signals. Second, you have now so many statistics. Everybody's doing statistics these days. Make sure you benchmark yourself versus your peers. Especially if you have financing agreements with the banks. And if, because you still have a chance, if your financial performance is better than the peers. And third, monitor what happens with your bank home, not here, because that might be a very strong trigger. I really hope that with all the interventions that the, all the governments uh, uh, from America to Western Europe did, the banks will be okay. But if not, then we will be screwed because simply there will be a huge flow of capital from offshore home. And then, uh, the whole Romanian economy will be, will be in big trouble. So the hope is not with the state, ignore them. The whole policy in the state is still done by this 
type of 20th century nationalism that it's the former securitate. I don't see anything change there. The mindset is still that one. Plus, they, they are completely disconnected with the economy. But the economy now is not local, and this is our hope, is global. We are linked to all these global ecosystems. And from there, either our salvation or our uh, sudden death will come. Let me challenge you there. Aren't we less connected than a month ago? Number one. Number two. Aren't we in a situation where a very genuine bi Romanian mentality will for the first time emerge in the Romanian market? Like very genuine, not government initiative, by Romanian. I cannot, Why do you I think don't we know. are less connected? What made us less hmm? connected? What, why do you think we are less connected? I'm thinking that we see limitations in the movement, not only on the movement of people, but we are seeing limitations in the movement of not the capital for the time being, but the movement of goods. I think so there is a, a there is a little bit of a fear. That, yeah. Sorry. I think that for the time being, the supply chains are as connected as they ever were. And it, they are not easy, easily turned around. I mean, the fact that somebody is producing a thousand ventilators here and there does not change the way the whole global economy works, at least not by now. And in terms of capital flows, certainly we are as connected as we ever were. Um, but I would say also that we are more prepared than we ever were. And I think that we learned something from the crisis in 2009. If you remember when, when Congress approved 600 billion uh, bailout for the banking system, for the financial system actually, in the US in 2009, first of all, it was a big public outcry, a big public outcry. It was a drama. Then, yeah, it was a drama. Actually, they needed executive intervention to pass it because uh, it was almost blocked in Congress. It took a long, long, long time to make the decision because of that. And it was 600 billion. Now they are talking about 2.5 trillion. The decision was made in two days and nobody beat an eyelid. And the same happened in Europe. So people are throwing money yeah. like popcorn, like confetti on the table. It's actually a little bit disturbing to me, but the thing is that they understood that it's very important to react fast in order to stop the, the economy from going into a tailspin. And I think they are kind of prepared to do that. Um, on the other hand, the dimension of the problem is on a completely different scale. And I was a little bit shocked when it started in Romania to see that people didn't understand this. I heard the Florin Kutsu, who I personally appreciate, uh, saying that they are prepared and they have everything ready because they have a package of intervention, 2% of GDP. And I said, are you fucking crazy? I mean, this is a 20% of GDP problem. It's not a 2% of GDP. At least don't promise that you have all the tools available because the problem is much higher. In 2009, the, the unemployment claim in the US peaked at 650,000. And now they are at 6 million in two weeks, 6 million. So it's a problem that is a bit, basically 10 times bigger than the one in 2009. Now what we do have in our favor, however, is that in 2009, it was a systemic problem. It was a major crisis of trust. And we do not have that major crisis of trust in the system right now. Uh, somehow magically, but we don't have this crisis of trust in the system. And um, I think that this is something that we have going for us this time. We have an amazing question. Thank you, uh, We have an amazing question from our um, panelists in the first uh, Leadership in Time of Crisis uh, gathering, Dan Stefan, whom I guess we all know. 
And the question is, how do we fight the populist and authoritarian surge, especially when the majority is welcoming it? Is it inevitable? So first, first of all, do you see this populist? The question of Romania, the, the issue of Romania, I see this because Romania is split in two different kingdoms. First kingdom is the, the kingdom the, the of courage, crisis. I call it. Before the crisis, the first kingdom was the kingdom of courage. And in this kingdom, the citizens take care of their self and they think their destiny is in their own hands. And my impression was that most of Romania is in, in, into the kingdom of courage and only few of us, uh, you know, the, uh, the pensioners and stuff are in the kingdom of fear. Kingdom of fear means your destiny is in the hand of the others. And that was a constant fight between these kingdoms in Romania in the last 30 years. And unfortunately, the guys in the kingdom of fear, which are the politicians, they managed to, they managed to recruit much more citizens into their kingdom, which means people that rely for their survival into the state, either because they work for the state or because they work for companies dealing with the state in the non-transparent way. And I was shocked to see when I wake up that in the kingdom of fear, there is not only a, a few, few, let's say, dozens or few dozens of thousands, the guys that are, you know, the, the elite connected to public funds, but there are all these millions of people working either for the state or for, for state-related kind of businesses. In the kingdom of courage, the politicians does not, does not, do not matter. You don't care about them. In the kingdom of fear, you are afraid that uh, uh, they can jeopardize your future. And unless this government is able to release citizens from the kingdom of fear, i.e. to move away from the public system, hundreds of thousands of people into the kingdom of courage, then at votes, more than half of the people will vote based on fear. And then populism is weighting them like, you know, uh, like uh, the fox is waiting for the rabbit to come out. Uh, but we still have the chance to initiate reforms there and to give people the chance to take their own destiny into their hand. How many of them like it? I will tell you very few. In my executive search experience, I have recruited, in, I have interviewed uh, quite a few people from, from uh, uh, working in public institutions. And I was shocked to see how different the mentality there is versus somebody that you know, works in, in, a, in a private sector. I was absolutely shocked to see how the mind is changed completely based on the, on the environment you are acting and on this kind of sociopathic systems. In normal systems, the good and the bad is measured by general standards. In sociopathic systems, the good and the bad is measured by bias. Like if you are a normal people, then you know that not paying taxes is bad and paying taxes is good. If you are a football player, like the guys that went into jail without even knowing that they did something wrong, if you pay taxes, you are friar. If you don't pay taxes, you are schmecker. This is the difference between, you know, uh, 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 the courage system and the fear system. And uh, I'm afraid that this government will fail to release people from here into courage, and then yes, but we Mircha, go which, straight into populism. Mircha, which government ever did that in the history of humankind? Um, I mean, history is it's 
if we look into history, we should be terrified, as Adrian uh, said. I mean, I, I, I can't think of one historical reference to, to give me hope. Uh, I mean, all the, all the examples that I have uh, tell me that this is not going to be any better. Um, so um, how, keeping your analogy, how can, when did a government and how will it ever happen that a government brings people to be courageous and assume responsibility and all those things that we all here uh, value? Uh, and I'm not yeah. saying that you're not all over the world. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 yet to think of an example. And please help me out if I if I if I can't remember correctly when when a when a situation of of crisis was interpreted by the by the politicians as a as a way to move the society from from a, a less responsible population to a more responsible and courageous and um, um, yeah, uh, you, you got it. I can't think of I I can't think of I, one. I, I would argue there were there were the Reagans and the Thatchers of the universe and uh, in, in that thing. And but there there were some balances. But I would argue on on the topic that you know although you find examples like that, every every major moment of discontinuity is. Uh, you know, reshaping the universe in in, uh, in a way, and we have a moment of discontinuity that is quite likely to take us into the realm of fear, not into the realm of um, courage. And this is because, uh, Mircea, taking your your example, this is not only happening at the economic level, which is a bit more abstract. It's happening at even even lower level in the Maslow pyramid. Is about life. So many of our friends, you know, with our own with our, within our own bubbles are, I think, taken away into fear by fear for their own life and health. While economically, not let alone at the you know, more uh, aspirational levels, they would be theoretically the realm of courage. But now in this concrete environment, they would go aggressively to support the populist and controlling government simply because it's safer health-wise. I would say that uh, Thatcher was saved by populism. I mean, if it wasn't for the the war with the uh, Argentinians, uh, she would have <laughs> probably lost the election. But uh, she yeah. she was lucky enough to to find a, a a greater enemy than the than the unions and the strikes and all the, the all the mad thing I'm, I'm enemy is the virus. Yeah, but imagine like this. if. if yeah, so we need a better, a, a bigger enemy. Like, <laughs> what can be worse? Like an asteroid? Like, is that the... <laughs> in, in tougher times, Churchill did it. In the end, what were the the free promises Churchill made to the to the British? Sweat, blood, and tear. Yes, but I uh, I, I I get it, and I I try that in I'm Romania. Try that in Romania. In Romania, Adi, we desperately need, after 30 years of, uh, 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 you know, um, crypto communists, we desperately need a liberal government to start doing it. Because yeah, but this is the thing the that... Is that... It needs to be elected, you know. There is this famous <laughs> anecdote about Junkers, who was in a press conference and the, and the young journalist was pestering him with questions. And he lost his he lost his marbles, and he said, "Young man, we all know what we need to do. You tell us what we do to be elected afterwards." <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> and I mean, like, let's not forget. I mean, like the 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 British were not in great shape after World War Two. I mean, like with, with with Churchill. I mean, like if you take well, the post World War Two, and they keep his ass out of the office. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, like, you take post Churchill and pre Thatcher. I mean, like, depending on your political orientation, but uh, the the economy was not doing great, and uh, the government was involved in in everything. Going back to Adrian's observation that once you give you give a central authority the, enough power, it's very hard to put to put the genie back into the bottle. And it it happened. It happened in the UK, although 
we all clap for Churchill. Churchill was great. Churchill was amazing. But even with Churchill in, in power, let's not forget that, 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 that UK was fundamentally different in a worse way than the UK pre-war. And I'm talking here about economical liberties or civil rights, you name it, right? Um, and probably Romania will, will, will have it worse because we're not British. Yeah, and they, you, you've just destroyed my optimism, Vladimir, because now I realize <laughs> that, now I realize that in moments like this, uh, even people that were on the kingdom of courage so far, because of this uncertainty, they will, they will tend to, and I think this is in the end, this is the opportunity and this is what we desperately need coming at the beginning of the discussion. And I think this is the work of leadership guys these days. At that micro level with 70 waiters and, and, and chefs or with 10 uh, programmers, as a leader, every, all you need to do these days is to make sure people are staying in the kingdom of courage. Don't um, let them become a prey of that. the kingdom of fear. Go ahead. There are, Find just, ways I'll to make, do it. I'll make just two remarks uh, on what you said, uh, Nitya. One of them is that we need to be aware, however, that the kingdom of fear is about three times stronger than the kingdom of courage. This is how human psychology works. The, the animals who are brave didn't pass on their genes, okay? The animals who were afraid and avoided danger did. And we carry this legacy in our genes. Our psychology is very, very risk adverse. And we see this in a gazillion kind of studies, and you know it very well, and I know very well uh, from all the data that we have. This is one thing. And the second thing is, fear is not necessarily such a bad thing. Remember that when, when Churchill said his famous speech, what he actually did was to channel the energy of the people into one direction, because there was only one direction possible. And they, he made only one direction possible. And I think that the way to fight this is not to fight fear, but to fight anxiety, because anxiety paralyzes. And anxiety makes you feel powerless and makes you feel uh, a toy of destiny. And there is your, your locus of control moves outside of you. I, I'm not in control of my life anymore. And this, this is what a leader should should fight right now. They should turn anxiety into fear. And how you turn anxiety into fear is make it concrete. And the problem that I see with the political leadership right now, I don't know about the corporate leadership, but the problem that I see with political leadership is that they frame it in terms of uncertainty. And you should frame it in terms of enemies. And there, there should be a clear path of resistance or a fight to where the enemy is. And for that, you need to provide some level of certainty. For instance, to say, we are here, we are doing this in order to, I don't know, go back to normal life in two months from now. Maybe you'll hit it, maybe you don't, but this is our objective. This is what we are trying to do. This is what, how it, it should, these are the, the main steps that we should take in order to get there. We are executing this and let's pull ourselves together to execute this because this is our enemy right now. And a little bit of fear always helped in times of change. But what we have now and what is driving this mass reaction is not fear, is anxiety. And that we need to fear more than fear itself. It's like they say, Brilliant. Adi, it's like they say in, in, in strategy. Uh, a plan should scare a little and excite you a lot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, in and the that, history that's what we say in leadership and change management as well. You yeah. need to be a little bit scared and a lot excited. Brilliant. Let yeah. me take this moment one for, for a second because you are you, and focus on the question mark that you raised, it, Adi. And this this was you know uh, the governments don't do. I don't know 
about the organizations, about the corporates, about the uh, entrepreneurs. And given that our audience here is luckily not of politicians, not even aspiring politicians, but of managers and entrepreneurs, how would you, you know, since we are approaching the end of this conversation, how would you rate this balance brought in our discussion by Mircea for about uh, fear and anxiety and how should they deal with it? If you're a manager, typically a middle manager, not the top manager in an organization, how about if you're the entrepreneur? Look, what should you? There was this. I heard it. I heard it uh, a number of times. Uh, I also read about it in, in some articles. Uh, whether in times of crisis shouldn't you be more authoritarian as a leader? Well, I think you should be maybe maybe a little. But I think you should be authoritarian as a leader in any kind of situation, as, as long as you understand what is your level of decision making, what decisions belong to you. And these decisions you need to make, you need to be decisive. So I would rephrase and reframe the idea of being authoritarian in, in the idea of being decisive. You shouldn't make other people's decisions ever, but you should make yours. And your decision in times of uncertainty like this is to provide certainty, enough certainty that people can coalesce and find, find a common enemy if you want. And it's rather easy to coalesce people towards a, a common enemy, but right now this is not happening. So I think what you need to do is to channel this fear into action. Remember that fear also drives fight, not just freeze and not just flight. So turn this whole anxiety into energy to fight a common enemy and define and identify a common enemy. But what we say in, in um, executive search is that good leader meet targets. Outstanding leaders meet targets and build exceptional teams. And great leaders leave a legacy. These are the moments to leave a legacy that will fuel, you know, the, the whole uh, uh, mystical storytelling of the organization for ages eventually. I'll give you an example of two armies facing the same threat, Romania and Poland in World War II. Romania lost 20% of its territory, well, more than that, without shutting one bullet, guys. Poland, when was invited, they fought the German panzer, the German tanks with their uh, 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 cavalry. So people on horses were fighting the German tanks. At that gesture that was so a la Don Quixote, so to speak, they know they have no chance. But that was something that fueled the, 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 let's say, the collective mentality of a nation for almost a century. We missed that opportunity 70 years ago. And we, we are not at war now. Fighting from the coach in the, in the living room is a joke. If you tell this joke to your grandparents, they will slap you on the face. Yeah, but but still... Like in our, own, in our own micro ecosystems, we fight a war. Fight it at all costs and choose honor instead of basic fear and anxiety and other uh, foolish uh, kind of instincts. I think your, your, your example, uh, Mircea, uh, gives more, uh, more weight on Adrian's argument because I would say the, the Polish had... Uh, knew what what they were fearing <laughs> i mean like the whole poland history is is a long series of rapes if you will historical rapes uh poland was uh, divided uh many decades before before that invasion and i guess they they were put in a situation where they kind of knew what's what's coming to them while us we we didn't we didn't we didn't have that that object of fear in in history, and I, I think we should have. Uh, 
if if we I don't know knew what I don't know what Nazism would do or what communism would do to us maybe we would have fought it more bravely but uh, we had no idea what those concepts were uh, uh, the Polish didn't either but they had a long history of what it means to to have greater powers play with you like you don't matter um, so yeah I mean how do we find that 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 common enemy that 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 emotional enemy to uh, to give us the, the courage to it's fight also, the battle. So it's also unfortunate that our way of fighting is actually passive resistance. We are masters of passive resistance. As a friend of mine puts it, the Romanian resistance is not a wall. It's a volleyball net. You know, <laughs> you go and it, it goes with you. And then when you're tired, it bounces back <laughs> and then comes back where it was. So if you look, if you look, for instance, at the Transylvanian uh, fortified churches, the Saxon villages were built around the fortified church and each family had a small area there where they, they would stock their, their stocks of food and in times of trouble, they would just re retreat inside those fortified walls and be able to resist whatever amount of time. If you go in Romania, however, this side of the mountains, we built our houses digging, digging holes in the ground and putting some sort of roof upon them. And if enemy came, we packed everything and ran into the woods and we waited them out. And then we, when we came back, they, they set everything on fire, but there was not too much to burn. So in a couple of days, we built it back as it was. This is a very, very, very different mentality about how to deal with conflict and how to deal with hardship. Our traditional approach to hardship, at least not just in this part of the country, the, the whole country, our traditional approach to hardship is to wait it out. And in this particular situation, waiting it out is a catastrophe. And that's something that we need to fight. I, I, I see a hope here, um, Adrian, because every house in Romania today looks like a Transylvanian fortress in terms of food stock. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I remember a conversation between an entrepreneur. Donuts. And said, Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a conversation between an entrepreneur and, uh, and the bank uh, in the last crisis. And it was like, you know, like that joke. Guys, these are my principles. If you don't like, I have some others. Okay, guys, we, we, we kept Vladimir into the dark already. <laughs> okay, um, coming, coming back to light, I think uh, this was an amazingly interesting conversation. It's um, our time's up. Um, one last word that you want to say on hope. What's our best hope for the next, I don't know, very short term, 30 to 60 days? I'll start first. My hope is that every one of us will fight, will find Prometheus inside himself. I, I'll be a little bit uh, longer than this. I think that organizations, businesses, and societies function quite a lot on a sort of Nash equilibrium in which there is a certain legacy of the way things are done, a certain culture of the way things are done, and that is very difficult to change. Even if you know it's not the best one, it's very difficult to change. The combination of incentives, risks, um, time horizon of, uh, of your mandate, of your personal career plans and all everything makes it very difficult to change. The opportunity right now is that we have just received the global reset to this. So we are like pretty much, not 100%, but pretty much in very, very many situations, we have the opportunity to do a clean sheet design to what we are doing. 
And this is really the opportunity of a lifetime. I think most of us will not see it again in their lifetimes. So think about this. If you had to design your business from scratch on a blank sheet of paper, would you do it the same way? And if you wouldn't do it the same way, this is the time to redesign it. Vladimir. Um, yeah, as much as we discussed uh, macro politics and the world situation, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to live uh, my life uh, separated from the news because those are most of the events that uh, I cannot I cannot influence um, and uh, reading the reading the news and watching stupid politician which uh, with ideologies that not only I, I don't approve of I kind of despise uh, will kind of ruin my my daily existence so um, I, uh, I, I, I focus on what's under my control. Um, and uh, I have a small team of amazing people. We're building, uh, we're building a, a great product. I'm, I'm helping organization that I'm part of. So I'm focusing on that, taking care of my family. I'm taking care of my parents, uh, things that I, that, that, I, that I can do. Uh, and that's kind of what, I'm, I'm hoping that more of us would do uh, and to get out of this state of paralysis where we're all watching the news and we're commenting on what the other people are doing and what's going to happen tomorrow or will we get back to work uh, by Eastern or I don't know, Trump said that and our president said this other thing and we're all turning into into uh, specialists debating everything from uh, politics to economics to epidemiology or all these other things. And if we could focus on what we can control, uh, I think uh, we would bounce back in, in greater shape than, uh, than when this crisis started. One of my favorite saying is don't let any crisis go, uh, go to waste. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying don't to... Don't spoil a good crisis. Yeah, yeah, don't spoil. <laughs> exactly. And, I, and I'm trying to, to, live that, to live that saying. And uh, I hope most of our listeners are going to do the same. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Let's hope uh, uh, the Easter will not, will not be Paștele uh, <laughs> Cailor. Easter, the, the never, ne never coming Easter of the horses. Um, so, um, th th thank you so much, uh, Adi, Mircea, and Vladimir. I think we had an amazing, amazing conversation. I'm um, uh, really happy that we keep our moods up and we keep uh, resisting and finding resources for courage. And I think I, I, I found it very insightful that fear is actually what leads us to courage and anxiety doesn't. So with that thought in mind, I hope that we will find our route to conserve the energy until we can build things back up again and we can have the energy to come back and rebuild a democratic, transparent, optimistic and profitable society when this is over. Thank you so much.